Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Call the meeting to order. Looks like I have the privileges tonight. So if everyone would just bow your heads, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be present with all the citizens, both in, press, in person and or on video. We thank you for the privilege of the five commissioners for being able to serve our citizens and you. We ask that you keep our meeting in, in your mind and have us perform what you feel is best for this county. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next up is the motion for approval of the agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Okay, public comments. Rudolph Castini. That's close. Close <laughs> <That's> enough. <laughs> Cortesi. Cortesi. Sorry. How are you? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. <laughs> My name is Ralph Cartassi. Uh, I live at 270 Steeler Street, Mavin, North Carolina. Uh, and I own Rad Industries and Rad Range. Good evening. <clears throat> I want to point out a few missing uh, items from the last two meetings. Central Carolina Gun Club opens on Sundays at 9 a.m. as an outdoor range. They're also taxed as farmland, not a club like Rad is. Durham Rifle and Pistol Club opens up on Sundays at 10 a.m. It's also an outdoor range. They also tax as other structures, not as a club like Rad, Rad is. Rad Range now must open on Sundays at 12 noon to outdoor range. Rad Range is taxed as a shooting club. I want to point out the unfair advantages my direct competitors have against Rad, not only in time of shooting, but also in taxes. As the owner of Rad Industries and Rad Range, we will honor the agreement the sheriff and I have talked about and not open until noon on Sundays. Rad will have RSOs on the range. I just want to state for the record that I'm against any ordinance that infringes on our Second Amendment rights. And this is going to be an infringement. If you want to make an ordinance about gun ranges, then let's follow Rad's example and lead in safety. Rangers must have staff when they're open to ensure that bullets don't leave the ranges. First aid kits must be provided in case something does happen to include chest seals, tourniquets, and skin clips. All rangers must be taxed correctly. All ranges open on Sunday at noon to stop unfair advantages. All ranges must have guests and member tracking like Rad does, which is digital. We can tell you who's on the range, when they're on the range, what time they got there, and what time they leave. No other range in this county can do that. Finally, include protections for the county ranges. The ranges in place right now will be grandfathered in from any new existing oranges that may come after the county commissioners being here to stop homes being built on top of us and stop people from exercising their right to shoot safely. Rad Industries and Rad Range wants to set the standard for safe shooting in Alamance County. We are the safest gun range in the Alamance County area, and we are the most popular. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Young. <laughs> the not so great color take one pass along. <laughs> not so great color printing of the map. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sure. Well yeah. <laughs> I'm here to it's okay, I get that a lot. <laughs> 
Okay. Let me I'm, just state, everybody, every speaker has three minutes, and it is time. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate you letting me speak, Mr. Chairman, board. Um, my name is Jim Young, and uh, I'm the president of Durham Pistol and Rifle Club. Uh, the club, uh, the the name is a little misleading because we've been in Alamance County since, uh, I believe, 1976. They were originally where Research Triangle Park was, uh, and we know what happened there. So they were moved, and uh, <clears throat> I've been fortunate enough to be the president for quite a while. And uh, I just found out about this um, this new regulation and ordinance coming about, and uh, I prepared a statement, and I just wanted to read from that. Um, on behalf of the Durham Pistol and Rifle Club, uh, respectfully request that the proposed ordinance regulating the discharge <clears throat> in firearms be tabled until such time that it can be determined whether or not there are existing county laws and regulations which, if enforced, would achieve the same objective. Or if there are not <clears throat> proposed regulations, they can be studied by all concerned parties and optimized to ensure it achieves the intended objective and does not result in unintended consequences that will be difficult, if not impossible, to undo. Um, I'm going to save you from reading the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> Durham Pistol and Rifle Club is a nonprofit shooting club. We've been around since it was established in 1946. We are not a competitor for anybody in this county. We don't do it for money. We have one of the finest ranges in the in the country we don't um we, we don't do it for profit we have women's training we have special forces active active duty special forces and retired special forces probably every quarter coming down and do training we have specialized gender specific classes basic classes advanced classes um to advance and and create more interest in the shooting sports and just competitions etc we are not competitors we're not in it to make a make a buck you know there's there are some that are but we are not um and uh it was stated earlier that they don't have any, they have a way of tracking their their uh their members uh, we also track our members we have video surveillance at every one of our ranges um, customer or customer a member walks by with their phone <clears throat> they're picked up we know where they went and we do this not to spy on people we do this so we know where the money for the membership needs to go so we know what ranges need improvement the berms built back up anything like that we also uh, make it a point to uh, purchase as much surrounding land as we can to increase our buffer around the community and we do have a safety committee anything that we do on that range the first thing it does is go to the safety committee and they check it out and make sure i appreciate it thank, thank you for letting me speak salvation coffee salvation coffee salvation coffee yes. sugar-free <laughs> hazelnut yeah. i thought that was good thank you but if it helps i thought that was you <laughs> Did he may not get a copy? I did. I got two for some. He did not. I did get a copy. I did. This is it, right? That's it, right? You walk into it. Okay, Lisa Ralph. Greetings. My name's Lisa Rowden. I live at 218 Woodlawn Road in Mebane. I am up here representing myself and a community group who for the last two years have been working pretty hard at trying to educate the public about the need for a public defender's office. I'm not here to ask anything. I'm not here to preach about anything. I'm here to thank each one of you and collectively for having this resolution on the, on the ballot tonight. Our elected officials know that this is important. It's gotta be done. It's, you know, if nothing else, it's for equal and just representation for everybody. 
but they can't do it without you guys' support. And you're, you're going to talk about that tonight, and I am here for myself, for the folks who are working with me to try and make this happen, and the almost 1,000 people who have already signed our petition. Uh, the community is behind you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Lori Avert. Avert. Did I pronounce that correctly? Avert. Thank you. I'm on an entirely different topic tonight. My name is Loray Averett. I live at 501 Pebble Drive, Gibsonville. Um, so several weeks ago, I received the new tax reevaluation on my property. Um, I was stunned and shocked to say the least. A um, few little things I need to share so we can get a picture with the tax reevaluations and with the conversations that are here and will be coming with how the Alamance County Commissioners are going to adjust our tax rate, which is still not to be a piece of the puzzle that's not known yet. Um, just a little bit of background history on myself, everybody's situation on these reevaluations. I've heard many opinions and thoughts from neighbors, people in other communities everybody has a different perspective on some of these tax reevaluations so i'm going to speak to mine and how this is going to impact me um, i uh, did work for government services for 30 about 38 years in my life um, i'm 68 years old 10 years ago i had a larger house and land i sold that i wanted to downsize I knew I was aging up and I was going to be re facing retirement at around probably 64, 65 years old. I had to have property that I could manage, property that I could take care of. There's only me in my home. Um, I did not want to come home and mow two acres of land and weed eat, spend the rest of my life working in the yard. And as I aged up, perhaps my health would slowly start that decline and that <coughs> deterioration as we no, some of us in here, maybe some of us not. So I kind of, so when I was around 55, 56 years old, I sold, I bought a smaller home in a small community in Gibsonville. It was something that I felt comfortable that I could afford and stay in and live in based on the price of the house, what the neighborhood looked like, and it was a safe, it's a fairly safe little neighborhood. Uh, and I made that decision along with looking at as I aged up and projecting out slightly on what my retirement um, income would look like and what my Social Security income would look like. And I set my life up going forward based on that. Now, my tax value on my home when I purchased it was 128000 I lived there five years and all the exhibits are going to reflect that. I lived there five years, that tax value fell to 124, 124,000. That's what I've been paying for the past six years. Now the reevaluation time has come. My house is now valued at close to $234,000. I went to sleep on December 31st and woke up January 1, unbeknownst to me, that I now own almost a quarter of a million dollar home, which at the time when I purchased that home, I could not have even qualified for such a home. I did, I know the three minutes is up and I do truly apologize. I thank you for your time. I have met with the tax director. We are, you know, gonna be looking at the tax rate numbers for Alamance County and, and the town of Gibsonville. The one thing that I will say in closing in my sharing remarks is if my, and I have an appeal in to the Equalization Board for a review of what's went on with my, my property, particularly that is now 21 years old. Um, I did not and do not qualify for the homestead. I, I apologize, I'm gonna help right. y'all. Thank you, okay. I appreciate your time and I hope you take this into consideration. Everybody's circumstances are gonna be different. 
I'm looking at the end of life. Some people are looking at the beginning of life, of building and growing. I'm looking at staying there. I hope I do not get placed out of my home. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. I have to bring, you should bring that topic up. Katie Fawcett. You don't get time to talk Good evening. My name is KD. I work for Rad Industries and Rad Range as an RSA. I served in the U.S. Army as an 11 Bravo infantryman. Um, I know firearms very well as long as firearm safety. Um, I want to ask our RSOs that make sure customers that come to Rad Range are shooting safely. Customers shoot at a 20 degree downward angle into a berm that is over 30 feet tall on the pistol and 25 feet tall on the rifle. Rad Range has first aid kits and rules on range posted, and they are enforced by myself and RSOs who are on ranges with the customers at all times. Rad range is a range with digital check-in. We know who is on the range at all times. If you want to pass an ordinance pass, an ordinance on safety, first aid kit for shooting, and blood loss, RSOs must be there to make sure the people are safe. I ask to protect our range and our county. Thank you. Thank you. And we thank you. I'm going to apologize for not pronouncing the last name. <laughs> April is the first name. Would you come forward and yeah. pronounce your? Uh, yeah, it's Couturier, but Campbell Couturier. I prefer to go by Campbell. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, good evening, commissioners. My name is April Campbell, and I come to you this evening with great concern. This is very off topic from, from the drag queen story hours that have been taking place across America and most recently in Forsyth County. That is too close to for comfort for me and many other citizens, parents, and grandparents in Alamance County. I'm not making this personal or about anyone's life choices. Many parents have come to me with concern because of the effect this has on our children. It is sexualizing our children, confusing them, and possibly exposing our children to pedophilia. The books they read to the children are very inappropriate as well. These books can also be found in our school libraries. I've sent numerous emails to our school board about the books, but only one book has been removed so far. The rest of the list has been ignored. Forsyth County Commissioners approved this last event three to two and never once did anyone make the parents of these underage children aware of the event. In this event, a drag queen straddled a 14 year old child dancing. Sad thing is Forsyth County is welcoming back these same people on April the 23rd. In the event these shows must come to Alamance County, parents are respectfully asking that they be limited to groups 18 years and older, audience only, we're only trying to protect our children. And Tennessee recently adopted Senate Bill 3 by Governor Bill Lee, banning adult cabaret slash drag show performances from taking place on public property or where children are present. I intend on trying to do the same for North Carolina. Thank you for your time. And we thank you. Thank you. Paul Caps. <clears throat> I can pronounce your name. <laughs> you can. You can. You've got that. Paul Caps, 3259 North NC Highway 62. I'm not going to take three minutes. I'm just going to. I looked at your last meeting. I wasn't able to be here. But, Ms. Thompson, you made a comment about the gun range. Were there any houses going to be built at the gun range? There is 35 homes right in line of the gun range to be built. I'm not in, in any kind of way gaining money by telling you that i just know the people that own the property and that's what they're planning on doing 35 homes and mr carter you talked about ricochets bullets uh i don't know for sure about steel targets they're going to have at red industries but that is a ricochet problem also and you talked about rocks they have worked on the berms but they just took dirt that was down on the ground so there's rocks probably in those berms so I don't know what the ordinance you're going to talk about tonight, but uh, just wanted to let you know to think about that, what it might be. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, and it looks like W O Wolves. W like more than one wolf. Okay. And I'll be <laughs> three minutes later. I want to know about the taxes as well. I cannot figure out for life of me how someone can just arbitrarily double property taxes. Now, on double wides, mobile homes, they depreciate. They do not appreciate. And there's a bunch of records on file from back in 2014. 
where we went through this before and I got it adjusted because it was ridiculous. I've got a lot of damage to my house because I have dogs and I had mice and huskies and pit bulls both have a strong predator instinct so they have torn holes in my walls. My central air went out in 2014 and I was using window air conditioners. And I, I want to know what justification and where they come up with this figure and how, did, how they came up with it so we can get it corrected because there's no way you can double a person's property taxes just apparently on a whim. I don't see any justification for doubling the property taxes like that. Not at all. So I want to know how y'all come up with this. I'll come back later to find this information, but I want to see it in paper, in writing, so I can take it home and study it and figure out how we're going to correct this problem because that's like saying, I'm going to cut your paycheck to a quarter of what it is because I don't think it's worth the work you do. That's the effect of what you've done about doubling the taxes. And that cannot stay. That cannot stand. That should be decided by all the citizens of this county, not some arbitrary group that we elected to do this. If that's how it's going to work, then we need to make a change in this and maybe get some other people in this job. Thank you. Everything. Let me remind everybody, there's a county commissioner's comment period at the end of the meeting. And at that point, we can address some of these issues but at this point in the meeting, we cannot. Um, so I would encourage you to sit around toward the end of the meeting and see if you can get some answers to various questions that have been posed here. Next thing on the agenda is the consent agenda. Well, Mr. Chairman, I move that we adopt the consent agenda, <coughs> excuse me, agenda with the exception of the item 5D EMS write-off request and that we cover that in the presentation of other business uh, as a 6A1. Uh, I'll second that motion. Any other discussion on the removal of 5D? No, but I just want to ask, just up like the 5B1, the additional $321,600, is that is that to help cover for what we're going to accept as a write-off? No, it is not. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> With the exception of 5D, which is EMS write-off request, correct? Correct. Um, we have a motion and a second on approval of the consent agenda. All in favor? Signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Madam County Manager, I'm going to move uh, 5D to 6A and then we'll bump everything else down. Okay. Did we approve the agenda yet? Huh? Yes. We did? We did. Yeah. We did approve the agenda. We Just not the concession. Okay. We're good. We're good. All right. We are now moving to what was item 5D, which will now be just a sign of letter and a number. <laughs> <laughs> Who is presenting 5D? I can have our finance director answer questions, and I also have our EMS director prepared to answer questions. So, right. do you want us to introduce the item, or do you have specific questions you'd like us to hone in on? Ms. Fawcett, why don't you present it initially? Absolutely. And then we can discuss it. Absolutely. So, commissioners, before you tonight is a request for us to write off $1,556,054.32. And this is created from some ambulance uh, EMS bills. We are able to carry those for a period of three years after which they are deemed uncollectible due to our write-off policy. We have exhausted our efforts in trying to get those funds and we are respectfully requesting that that be written off as an accepted accounting principle tonight. And it would you, indicate to uh, everyone both in Audio land and in pro North Carolina has a three-year statute of limitations on debts. 
and if you're unable to collect them within that time period, uh, statutorily, these debts go away because the statute of limitations has now expired. Mr. Turner. Just a few questions. How do these bills get generated to an individual who uses an EMS uh, truck? Absolutely. And I will answer to the best of my ability, and then, Ray, if you need to jump in, please do so. Uh, so we actually have a contract with um, EMSMC to provide our billing for our ambulance services. So when CECOM has dispatched an ambulance to a resident's house, there's automatically a fee for that. A lot of our patients are on Medicaid, Medicare, so we file those and receive reimbursement, as well as insurance companies that are reimbursing for patient costs, as well as if there's a car accident, the car automobile insurance is responsible for that portion. What we're seeing here with these that we're requesting is that there are some of our citizens that do not have health insurance. And these are the ones that are the private pay. We have exhausted every avenue that we can to legally enforce collection. It's just we are not able to collect on these individuals. If you have Medicare, do you balance bill the patient for what Medicare does not reimburse? No, we can't balance no. bill. So Medicare does often charge, there's a copay. Mm -hmm but we can only go up to the Medicare allowable. So even if the county charged way above the Medicare allowable, and right now we charge 130% of the Medicare allowable, you have to stop at, the, at what Medicare allows you to bill and the rest has to be written. How about third party insurance? So most third party insurances will go up to 130 to 150% of what the Medicare allowable is. And each year Medicare publishes what the allowable is for EMS billing. And what do we do to try and collect this? Do we do it ourselves in-house? Do we farm it out to a collections agency? How do we do that? Uh, so we have a contracted uh, billing company that we use, and they do all of the first pass billings of the first three billing cycles. If they're unsuccessful, then we're contracted with a collection agency. And so they'll do 90 days of what we call soft collections, where it doesn't affect credit, then it goes into harder collections, and then simultaneously it goes into the North Carolina debt set-off program uh, which focuses on North Carolina tax returns and lottery winnings. We have a sense of, of how good we've been over the, these, this past three-year period as opposed to the three-year period before that in collections? Uh, we've seen an improvement um, in, our, in, in our cash collected over the last three fiscal years. Uh, just in fiscal year 21, we collected $5.1 in fiscal year 22, we collected 5.4 million, and then we are on track this fiscal year to do 6.2 million. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It might be good to show a comparison of what we've had to write off in the past because I know this, I don't know specifically how much we've written off in the past, but this doesn't sound that far out of sync with what I've seen in the past. It's not. Um, it, it, a lot of people you can't collect from. Yeah. Are you seeing over the years that this is growing? Like, I mean, I think the first year I was on, it, it was way up. Right. It ebbs and flows. Uh, I'll be quite honest. It, will, it ebbs and flows. This year was um, slightly higher than we had for write-offs last fiscal year, mm -hmm. um, but I can get the board information on those figures. Mr. Lashley, any questions? Uh, no, I just want to uh, make sure that, you know, we try to do a really good job of keeping our finances legit, so to speak. And when you have things like this that, you know, if you just take, don't take this into just one, one aspect of the whole thing, it's, it has everything to do with the whole pie. If you look at how much the county is spending for the new EMS center, um, when you take that in consideration, we are actually, the county's actually doing yeoman's work to try to provide this service, and yet here I am trying to keep taxes low, and this particular number is higher than a penny of tax receipts. Right, right. So this is costing the taxpayer one penny every single year. Um, just looking back at the numbers, I think I got this right. Uh, 2021, 5.1, and 2022, 5.4. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's the so money that you had collected. Yes, sir, yes. that's what we collected. Uh, what so was the outstanding balance that you were shooting for? I'm just curious what, what, per, what your percentage is, is, is coming in. Uh, so we collect approximately 72%. Okay. Perfect. Thank yeah. you very much. 
A lot of the uncollectible does come from private pay. So about 15% of the patients we transport don't have insurance. Okay. And the collection rate on that 15% is 5%. Gotcha. And that goes along with national averages. So is there any, like, are there any, like, difference? Like, every time I hear siren, ambulance, fire, I mean, they all go. What about the ambulance that just, like, goes to a house? My, my father's having a heart attack. I need 911. Are there all different kinds every time they go to a call like, with fire? Is that part of this as well? I mean, it is. Anytime they roll, right? Uh, so if we transport the patient or if we treat and then don't transport the patient, there is a charge. And it varies based on what's performed, and that's something that the billing company codes. Uh, but if we just go help someone off off the floor and there's no medical complaint, then there's no charge for that. And what if it goes to the detention center and has to get I don't, somewhere? I don't believe we charge the yeah. sheriff's office because that, that bill, once they become a prisoner of the sheriff's office, I believe the, responsibility the sheriff's down. office is So somebody's still paying for it? Correct. Okay. Do you see this? Like across counties? Yes, ma'am. Yes. And you even see added to the problem, you know, the high deductible, high deductible private insurance plans. So if somebody's got a five thousand dollar deductible, they're on the hook for the first five thousand. So if we transport them and they haven't paid anything towards their insurance, in effect, they become private pay, and so it's hard to collect from that uh, those folks as well. So we collect anywhere as far as Medicare to about 98% of all of our Medicare gets paid, 70% uh, for private insurance, and then all the way down to 5% for private. Debt. But this is not Medicaid. Medicaid, or is it? So Medicaid will pay whatever Medicaid. So Medicaid will only pay up to what they allow, and then you cannot balance bill. You can't do anything with Medicaid patients. So then that is that has to be written off. So all this Medicaid expansion, you're going to see money that will be part of that? That'll well, so that, that'll, that should decrease the amount of patients that are private pay and should therefore increase collections. Is it? At the same time, the number of calls are increasing, which is a bigger pie of we, calls that would, that would, we have that seen would a tend to increase that number. <coughs> yeah, you know, for the first few years I was here, we averaged 1,500 transports a month, and now we're doing 1,650 a month. So we've definitely seen our transports go up. I would think there's probably a lot of ODs, overdoses, and all this call, because I pulled up on one when I was going to finish out an application. I met Absolutely. her on the gurney getting into the bus. Absolutely. No insurance, no nothing. Okay. Have we seen overdoses of <coughs> increasing in a, in a greater percentage than the increase in number of transports? Uh, it seems to have been pretty steady. Steady? Yeah. And it's, that's one of those things that kind of ebbs and flows. You know, you go through spells where you won't have many, and then you'll have a lot in one day. Depends on when mm -hmm. bad dope gets in town. No, I'm not kidding. I know. Are there any other questions from this board? Motion to approve. Second. Motion to approve. Have a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Hey, we are back on the regular agenda. <coughs> Is that yours? I'd be happy to introduce it, Commissioners. Thank you. Uh, at your last meeting, Commissioner Turner asked that we draft a resolution for the board's consideration tonight to support an additional district court judge and a public defender's office. So that resolution is included in your packet. And Would you read the resolution, please? Can we put it on the screen? Oops, I pulled up the wrong thing. All right, read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Resolution in support of an additional district court judge and public defender's office. Whereas Article 4 of the North Carolina Constitution provides that the North Carolina General Assembly shall divide the state into local districts for the holding of a superior, holding of superior and district courts and shall provide and preserve an efficient allocation of judicial resources and whereas the last comprehensive reforms to the judicial and prosecutorial districts were made by the General Assembly in the 1960s, 
with only occasional piecemeal changes being made in the last 50 years, resulting in an unbalanced distribution of judicial resources. And whereas Alamance County's population has grown substantially in recent years, <coughs> excuse me, and continues to grow, causing a significant and predictable increase in caseloads of Judicial District 15A's four district court judges, and whereas the North Carolina Administrative Office of the Courts reported in July 2022 that the four existing district court judges for Judicial District 15A had the highest workload among all judicial districts in the state, and that Judicial District 15A needed at that time 4.89 district court judges to effectively accomplish its work. Whereas the number of criminal, civil, child, and family court cases filed in Judicial District 15A's district courts continues to increase, thereby exceeding the number of cases that can be promptly and efficiently heard by the current number of district court judges. And whereas the number of attorneys in Alamance County available for court-appointed representation of defendants charged with serious crimes is precariously low creating an unsustainable workload for attorneys willing to defend these individuals and increasing the risk for appeals. And whereas the Alamance County Board of Commissioners wish to ensure adequate representation of all individuals who face the deprivation of their liberty, to ensure efficient operation of the criminal courts, and to ensure that justice will be promptly served. Therefore, should the state see fit to fund a fifth district court judge and a public defender's office, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners is hereby committed to providing adequate space to support the additional needed judge and public defender's office. Adopted this day, we fill in the date, and signed by Chairman John Paisley and attested by Clerk Tori Frank. And if the resolution is uh approved it'll have to be voted upon by this board so that's before us at this point right. uh, I, before the meeting handed out a letter from uh, district attorney Sean Boone uh, and so all five commissioners have that Thomas if you'd like a copy of that and I'm not officially entering that into the minutes, but uh, did want the public to know that we received a letter of support from Sean Boone asking for both the 5th District Court Judge and the uh, Public Defender's Office. And it's a two and a half, almost three page letter. So, and that'll be, a, that's available uh, through the clerk's office. It was not in my possession in time for this meeting to be published. Mr. Turner. Uh, just a couple things, Mr. Chairman. I mean, I think the, the need for a fifth district court judge is self-explanatory. According to the administrative office of the courts, we've got the highest workload for district court judges in the state. We're at the highest, uh, the highest ratio of district court judges to work that exists. So I think that's, that's a no-brainer that we ask the General Assembly to provide that. The Public Defender's Office, um, I think the primary issue there for the county is, um, well, first of all, the state pays for indigent defense now. So the same defendants who would qualify for indigent defense under the existing system would qualify for indigent defense under the system with the public defender's office. The issue is efficiency, and the issue is workload for those attorneys willing to take serious high felony crimes. And just, just very few lawyers, I think four, four in the county who take those now. So I think that's needed to help uh, beef up that crop, or that group of attorneys and also just to keep efficiency moving so that defendants get their, their the defendants moving through the process uh, require both the prosecutor and the defense to, to work somewhat together to efficiently move those through the process. And if that if any one of those is, is not efficient, then defendants sit in the jail for an extended period of time and we just we don't need that for a lot of reasons. So I think for the public defender's office, that's my primary concern. And I think uh, getting the, asking the General Assembly to, to help us with that is, is important. Mr. Carr. Well, I, I agree with what Craig just said. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to sit in jail if you're guilty of a crime. 
It's another to sit in jail when you can't afford to post your bail, and uh, your attorney can't you can't get an attorney or you can't get the attorney to show up and work with you, or because of scheduling issues. And uh, I've been told that we have a number of people that have been in, incarcerated longer in some cases for uh, waiting on a trial than they might have been if they'd been convicted. So. Now that that this needs to be fixed, and I hope this is an option we have that might fix it. Mr. Lashley. I have no questions, no statements. Ms. Thompson. Well, I would just like to thank you all for wanting a public defender's office because um, I've been talking about this for a long time, and um, and I and I read in that about a public defender's office, you're going to want a property to put it in. So see, it almost looks like you're going to sell this public defender's office with your new courthouse. <laughs> I'm taking it that way um, because I know back in August when we went to the conference and I met with Mary Pollard and then she met me here at Village Cafe and I asked Craig to meet us there and she told us we were next on the list because it is that important. My husband's practiced criminal defense for years and years and um, it's a lot of people in there, but I just want to say this. Um, if you're rich or poor and you commit a crime, I'm sorry, but you deserve jail. That's the way that is. I, don't, I, don't, I can't help your checkbook when you're stealing somebody else's stuff or you're raping somebody or hurting somebody in worse ways than that. But um, I don't, um, you know, <laughs> oh my goodness, um, I am, 100% for the public defender's office. There, it's a no-brainer because you need a level playing field. They need their own detective. They need their staff. They need because <coughs> defense attorneys are one-man shows, and it is a lot to run 150 plus cases on you all the time. Um, I, I'm just. Are you telling me that in order to get this public defender's office, you're going to want that courthouse bill to put it in? Is that buy one get one free kind of thing? Is that what you're telling me? Because it reads that way. <laughs> because it, it is what I just heard her read was about. I, I can I can help I can, me, Craig. I can answer. That. I know I mean, this is your thing. Well, I, I brought it up at the last meeting, and I specifically said at the last meeting that, uh, that I think we need both of these, irrespective of whether we have a courthouse expansion, and I don't think that. I mean, I think the language is written broadly so that it doesn't imply that courthouse expansion is required. To, to join this uh, this resolution, I think the timing um, doesn't have anything to do with courthouse expansion either. At least in my motivation, the timing and we did have that meeting with Mary Pollard a while ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw your she, mother. Yes, yes. <laughs> and she, yeah, and uh, and, she, and she did indicate the, that it, this was desired at the state level. But the reason for the timing is that it's not in the budget. It's not in the budget. When the House created, mm -hmm. and at this moment, the budget that the House created is moving to the Senate, uh, and the Senate has an opportunity either to include this in the budget or not. And my thinking was that the timing of this allowed, you know, our friends in the Senate to say, you know, we got five Republicans, or we got four Republicans, or three, however many people vote for it, on the board who want this, and the Republicans control the Senate and and the House, and so our friends might say, this is a time when we can do that. That is the purpose of the resolution. That is the purpose of the timing of the resolution. And I think it ought to pass irrespective of what, what we do with the courthouse. Which obviously there are not three votes for, or that would have passed. So, I mean. I'm uh, just saying we just heard. Uh, yeah, I think, am I next? <laughs> I'm not done. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm just saying that. Um, I, I, that, that I don't want to have, it's like Solomon's baby sitting here, you know, which mother you're going to give the kid to, so to speak. Um, I'm all about public defenders because I've been talking about this for a good while, a good while. <coughs> and I don't, and it's just as clear as a picture to me that we need this um, for both sides of the aisle, so to speak. But um, it, it just, um, I don't want to feel like I got to vote for this public defender's office because I'm going to get dragged into this courthouse deal. Because if Judge Judy or Perry Mason or Matlock come in here and talk about this courthouse, I'm not going to support it right now because of the taxes being uncertain, 
everything is just a hot mess in this world. And I'm not going to vote to lay that kind of debt on citizens in my county. I'm just not. I'm not. So, um, but I'm going to support this public defender's office. And um, I want that. I'll just have to be a big no on the other when it comes along. And I will be. And um, that's, that's not to hurt anybody's feelings or take anything away from Graham or our county seat or anything like that. I just, I've told you the other day that I don't think it is the right time for us to go and spend that kind of money because it's not like when we take out a loan, we all pay for the loan. It's not my little coupon book that pays it. It's, it's the whole county that pays for it. And I, I, we're paying so much now. We just wrote off over a million dollars worth of debt that people can't afford to pay their ambulance. You know, it's, it's just all, like Bill was talking about, that's a penny in taxes. So um, that's just, that's, I don't really, it doesn't matter, I'm done. So. Okay, are you finished? So I'm so finished. finished. Okay. I'm really finished. <laughs> okay, one, Mr. Turner's dead on the money. <coughs> uh, the state and uh, state house and senate, or was senate, the House has already voted. The Senate's uh, got the bill up and coming. It is not in the current state budget. Uh, neither the fifth judge nor the public defender's office. Uh, and I think we, as a county board, have to show our resolve and ask that they add that back into the budget. If not, we have no chance, in my opinion. Um, so I think the resolution is well worded. Um, and I plan to, to vote for it. Um, we do have individuals sitting in jail I'm, as a practicing attorney of soon to be 50 years. I know that people are sitting in jail awaiting trial because there aren't enough judges. We are the number one county out of 100 counties for the appointment of an additional judge. Additionally, we are the number one county, again, based upon workload and cases being handled for the district attorney's office, and we don't have a public defender's office currently. Uh, currently, we have really good lawyers trying to spread the load of what otherwise would be a public defender's caseload. These are cases that are court appointed. Uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, you know, Pam's husband served and did a good job with that for many, many, many years. Uh, he is now retired, uh, and we just don't have enough attorneys sitting out there that are willing to be on the court-appointed list to fill that desperate need. So I plan to vote for both. It's a resolution. Uh, we send it to the state. Uh, we'll send it to each of our representatives and spread it as far and wide as we can on the state level asking for help. It's not up to us guys, it's up to the state representatives on a legislative basis. Any other comments? Yeah, Craig will remember this. Uh, Mary was, Miss Pollard was telling us that um, when these, if you're, if you're not retained, you can't make it doing all this kind of work because she was telling us if you are a sole practitioner and you have a secretary, assistant, whatever, by the time you pay your rent, your lights, your fees, your bar dues and your help, you make $16 an hour and you can make more than that at Hobby Lobby. So folks go to law school, to, they work hard, and they, they do big, serious stuff. You have people's lives in your hands. And, um, but we just have so much crime, I hope we can talk about, like with our drug addiction, how we can talk about real preventative measures to s saturate our community and get out in it, instead of always the after to where we are keep adding on, adding on, adding on for more and more crime. Cause um, I mean, we could have, we could buy them all, and we could fill it with all kinds of stuff, you know. So, and the jail, it's not going to be big enough either. So nothing's big enough, and um, it's just scary how every year it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it just keeps costing and costing and costing. And the very ones who make good decisions and and, and do right by everything are the ones who has to pay for all this. And I just, I mean, you know, it kind of sucks sometimes. So. Any other comments? I just uh, let me let me add to what Pam said. Pam, you're not you're not alone on this board with people who are struggling over the cost of this projected cost of this court building. I mean, it's um, it was a shock when we got the numbers, and uh, you know, 
a commitment like this is to provide space. It doesn't mean building a new building. I mean, maybe even renting some space someplace, or maybe using the uh, some of the space we already have when we finish relocating people out of the um, Board of Elections office into their new building. We can. That's one option that I've, I've looked at with uh, our district attorney, and he thinks there's enough space in there. Be need some modification, but there's enough space in there for it to be used for a defender's office. So, uh, you know, we've got to find a way to take care of our citizens, and we've got to try all of our citizens, the ones that are in jail, the ones that aren't, and uh, and do it as efficiently and cost effectively as we can. Well, I do know Ms. Pollard said it's really important that a lot of times your public defender is also in the same building as your district attorney because when they get their assignment in that courtroom, if they don't if they don't get them right then, you don't see them. And when you call, it's disconnected or there's no more minutes. So it's, it's like, you know, trying to find that defendant that's just gotten his first court appearance or her. It's really difficult to locate them sometimes. You said in the same building yeah, as the DA's yeah. office? a lot of courthouses have that. She highly recommended it. And she's over the public defender's office for the state. She probably knows what she's talking about. Any other comments? Motion to approve resolution. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? She announced. Thank you. Mr. Stevens, are you presenting the next item? I am. Good evening, commissioners. I'm back before you again this evening with uh, some slight modifications to the ordinance I proposed a couple weeks ago. I've gotten a lot of feedback, not only from you all, but from the community related to ways in which we might improve the language to make this a little more user friendly and also to clarify the purpose of the ordinance that you've already reviewed. So what I'm going to do is take a few moments to point out some of the highlighted areas that I learned from last time and we have visual aids this time to help you. Um, I have highlighted all the portions in the ordinance that I modified from the last time this was presented. Um, so first, in section one, I've added a statement here to clarify the purpose of the ordinance in that it is not construed to prohibit the otherwise lawful possession or carry of any firearm. I got a lot of response, feedback from the community before about the fact that they wanted to make sure this wasn't dealing with possession or carry of firearms, and I clarified that in the ordinance. Um, Mr. Turner also made some suggestions last time, and I think Mr. Lassie did as well, about possible redundancy in the language. So in section four, I've also clarified um, and, and taken some portions out related to how a back, backstop has to be constructed and simply said in section four that it is now unlawful for any person to discharge a firearm in any manner that causes or allows the projectile to leave the property on which it is discharged. And I'll remind the board that in any instance where this ordinance would be applied, there has to be a willful intent to violate the ordinance. So accidents aren't going to be encompassed by this. Accidents aren't criminal in nature. So just to make sure the public and the board is reminded of that. Um, I also got feedback about the written permission that was in the original proposal, what that form would look like. And I've taken that and amended it to make it permissive but not required. So in an instance where a projectile might leave the property of the person who fires it, um, one way that person could defend against any sort of argument that they had violated the ordinance would be to say, hey, I've got permission from the person where the bullet landed, and by the way, here it is in writing, so here's my defense up front. Kind of to avoid overcharging and to give folks an option to be able to present that up front to officers. I didn't make any changes to section five. Um, I made one change to section six to include property controlled by a person. So this section and the ordinance now is makes it unlawful for any person or entity to willfully allow another person on property owned, leased, or controlled by that person or entity to discharge a firearm in violation of the ordinance. The idea here is to make sure that others aren't allowing people on their property to violate the ordinance. I know there's been a lot of feedback from the community about businesses potentially being encumbered by this, I want to make it clear that my intent is for no one to be charged with a violation. And I, I believe, based on how I've worded this, that any business that operates with any reasonable degree of caution and advising the same to their customers is not going to have any trouble coming into <coughs> compliance with the ordinance. 
and I didn't make any changes to section seven or eight. So based on that, I'll be happy to take questions from the board. <coughs> uh, I didn't feel the need to go back through it all. I just wanted to highlight changes unless you would like something different. I would note that in section four, I uh, said previously shall obtain written permission, now says may obtain, and in the law there's a major difference between the word may and shall. May Correct. is permissive, shall is mandated. Correct. Yeah, that was one suggestion made by the board. If you recall a few weeks ago, I think that made a lot of sense. So the wording has been changed to reflect that. Thank you. Mr. Stevens, did you, need, did you do any research at the state level, local level, to see whether there are um, statutes or ordinances now which prohibit, which cover this activity? I did actually um, did some extensive research on that. Uh, both by my own search of our ordinances and also consulted the DEA to make sure that they didn't know of any law that would apply in an instance like this. There's not. Honestly, in my opinion, this is something that cries out for some level of statewide uniformity um, because the things we're talking about here can be pretty <coughs> severe in terms of the consequences if someone recklessly discharges a firearm, but there's just not. A lot of counties have an ordinance similar to this one, but there's no statewide statute that applies. Thank you. Mr. Carr. I had the same question earlier with Mr. Stevens, and I got the same answer before we got here today. So, Ms. Thompson. Well, I spoke with Rick earlier. Um, you all know this is not my gift, but um, I, I just, and I'll, I'll tell you what I told him. I said, I, none of this mentions noise. Beg your pardon? None of it mentions noise. That's and that's why the, the folks had come in about no noise and the and safety of it too and I just wanted to make sure um, I just want both parties to be okay with what this is because that's important but we do have to live together um, and I also don't want them in court all the time when somebody finds a shell casing you know they run the courthouse whichever courthouse so um, I, I, that's all it's just this is just a really hard hard situation and um, I want people to be able to go and I want people to be safe and, and be okay where they're living. Sometimes that's difficult. That's <laughs> right. Um, I actually, I just want to turn, Mr. Turner um, asked the question I was concerned about and I just wanted to, um, uh, to actually thank the parties involved here who got together to make some reconciliations to, to get this done and I appreciate the corrections that you made in the document before we first started. I think you've addressed everything that, that I asked you to. And uh, I just wanted to thank the, 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 the owner of RAD for working with our sheriff to, to uh, make a compromise, understand that safety is your number one goal. And I certainly believe that that's how you run your business. So that's basically all I have to say about this. I agree with you there, Bill. Uh, uh, in our last meeting, uh, Rudy and the sheriff stepped out and moved a <coughs> resolution. I thought that was fabulous. So. There's no need for this. Uh, Mr. Turner, one thing I just want to let you know, I just misspoke. I said DEA, I meant ATF. Mm -hmm. I was talking to DEA earlier today about something else. So <laughs> ATF. But there's nothing that they cover either. No. Right. no. <laughs> That's all I have. Thank you. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry, not at this point. Um, there were clear criminal laws that prohibit criminal activity such as shooting in dwellings, shooting in vehicles, damaging someone else's property. That is not what this is. Uh, and they are covered by separate criminal penalties that are in our North Carolina General Statutes. Um, this is not a willful shooting that, you know, someone trying to shoot at or shoot at or injure someone. All that's covered separately under our North Carolina General Statutes. Um, I think this clarifies a lot, and uh, I plan to vote for it. Any other discussion? Just a question, Mr. Chairman, about what what the procedure is. There, there are two readings, or two, two, how do we do we, this? We have two readings, and we would vote tonight on reading one, That's and correct. then the next meeting we vote again. Okay. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And just for clarification, that's because there's a uh, penalty involved in the this. financial penalty. Uh, yes, and also a misdemeanor charge as well. Right. 
Motion to approve. I'll second. Any other discussion? This is the approval for the first reading. That right. is correct. Correct. Any other discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous on the first reading. It is not law or an ordinance yet. That's two of them. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that one. <laughs> well, I have been told to bring this closer, which means it's where my hands go. <laughs> okay. All right, first reading passed. Uh, David Putnam, I think you have 5C. Hello, David. Hello, good evening, County Commissioners. Uh, I appreciate you uh, making the time to fit this on the agenda. It's my pleasure to be here before you this evening. What I would like to do is just provide a brief presentation and respond to any questions you all might have. Uh, and the presentation will cover background history of the proposed project um, and then kind of tail in what I'm asking of you all today for consideration. So. Um, I guess to start I should cover the title. Uh, <laughs> this uh, presentation is about the North Carolina Industrial Center. You might hear the acronym NCIC, that's what I'm referring to, and the Transload Rail Facility that accompanies it. So some key points or what I would like to call upshots about the Transload Rail Facility. Um, planning began for this facility back in 2015, around the same time that we recruited uh, Cambro, which is a manufacturer located in NCIC. Um, the proposed kind of conception of a unit that would own, operate, and maintain the facility would be a new nonprofit, NCRR, um, or excuse me, NCIC Railroad it would be that nonprofit's name. Um, the overall intent of using the nonprofit approach would be to keep costs low to enhance access and utilization. So when you imagine that kind of swimming pool approach, it wouldn't be to, for that facility or the nonprofit that's managing it to make a buck. It would be to keep costs low so that more uh, users could um, utilize the facility, access the facility, and make it so that it's a universally competitive asset uh, and infrastructure piece for Alamance County. Uh, and then that leads to that other point to add a, an added layer of competitive advantage to, the in, uh, to Alamance County's industrial growth and also just general growth. Um, we truly envision this Transload Rail facility to be an asset that's going to spill over into multiple jurisdictions, other counties, and have a tr uh, tremendous regional presence um, for Alamance County. So right there is the um, kind of the last bullet on this slide talks about the total cost of this overall project. Um, we're roughly at $3.2 million. Um, we were successful in the fiscal year 21-22 budget to recruit $2.6 million from the General Assembly in the form of grant. Uh, and then also um, the kind of the gap financing of this project we're asking uh, for you all to consider today as well as the City of Mebbins uh, City Council for their consideration in early May. Um, one last thing on this slide, you can see all the partners that have been involved in this process since 2015. Um, so we do have you guys uh, being a big partner in the recruitment of Cambro, which kind of got this conversation going, and CDOT, the State of North Carolina, City of Mebbin, the Chamber, Samet Corporation, North Carolina Railroad Company, and Norfolk Southern. Uh, so this is a very difficult image to see on the screen, um, but it is the engineering plans and outlines for the Transload Rail Facility that we're proposing for you all to consider. Um, the sum of this is really that there's two uh, car docking stations within the Transload Facility, and then you have three kind of individual spurs that run off where you can store cars. Um, so when you conceptualize this, you'll have a, a pretty seamless process where you're having kind of two storage lanes um, where industries and other users can take advantage of this asset um, and kind of get a queue going for the cars or what we would call the rail cars 
Um, and then those excess cars that are going to be picked up later or need to be stored nearby, they'll be positioned further down the lane on this map, the westerly portion of that map. But you'll see that blue kind of spur that comes off. Yep. Uh, so that's really important uh, to visualize when I go into this slide where we talk about how our products transloaded. You can see there's a bunch of different methods that folks can use to transload products from trucks, which is the intent of a transload facility is to move products from a truck onto a rail car. Uh, the primary methods I've kind of highlighted here, uh, what we're proposing is a forklift as the primary method. Um, to transfer the products onto rail cars from trucks because I've underlined uh, palletized right there. That's really the type of product that we envision being maneuvered here. Nothing that's like going to need giant vacuums or conveyor belts or pump transfers, cranes. I think that's a little outside the scope of this facility. Um, and so I've kind of outlined the types of products that can be transloaded you can see it's an exhaustive list. There's everything from beverages, oversized items, liquids, building supplies, and then this uh, guide actually puts a thing at the bottom, just about everything else. You can move just about everything from a transload facility, because uh, that's how we used to do things. That, that was the main method of maneuvering uh, products across the US. Um, but what I've circled is the primary areas that this site would accommodate. So that'd be household goods, foods and small items. So that would open the door for you know agriculture uses, um, that would open the door for uh, various kind of household commodities that are being produced across um, Alamance County and beyond. Textiles. Yep, textiles. Um, and so it, it's really a broad breadth. And then the small items could be things like sand, plastic pellets, uh, resin, sodas, things like that. So over the years, we've really generated a lot of interest for this facility. Um, and you can see just some of the industry examples I've offered you today, UPI, J-Bill, Ferrero Foods. Um, you see a sign of NCIC, the North Carolina Industrial Center. And then photo credits of uh, what we're really envisioning. So you can see the forklift there. Now that picture off to the right is pretty misleading. That's a little big. Um, so just remember, we're talking about two of those lanes. That's it. Uh, so I struggled to find a comparable transload rail facility photo. You just don't get a lot of flyovers of those facilities. Um, but if you imagine about 90% of that being eliminated, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> that, well, the bad news is 90% of it eliminated is the cost, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I feel like we've got a really good valued engineer product. And, you know, there's nothing stopping this from expanding in the future with that swimming pool approach. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> so I always like to wrap up the kind of the presentation of why I'm actually standing up here and sharing this information with you all. So what I'm asking for is uh, you all to motion to account for approximately $300,000 or to the better tune of three hundred. $1,843 for your capital projects in fiscal year 23-24 budget for the NCIC tra uh, Transload Rail Facility. Uh, and then I have additional notes there about the $2.6 million that was appropriated um, as a grant, uh, the facility's location of where it would be located with a geo pin, uh, and a disclaimer that local funds would be sp uh, split 50-50 and be the last resource utilized. So it could even be under the assumption that, you know, maybe we don't spend the max budget. Maybe we find cost efficient me uh, measures through the construction process and we don't use this full amount. Um, and that would protect kind of these funds if you guys were to consider allocating them or accounting for them, I think is more appropriate. Uh, protect them as the last resource used and that this would be a reimbursement style construction process. So we would be working with the developer to do a pay application approach where they would have to provide evidence of you know, materials used, activities completed, what percentage of those materials are stored and beyond. So thank you all very much and I'm happy to respond to any questions you uh, may have.
Now this is a one-time request, right? That's correct. And Sam is building it. Yeah, Sam it uh, would be a core development partner for this project. Ms. Thompson, you're first. I just asked if, like Sam it. That's all I wanted to know. There you go. Good job. So there's truly a lot of coordination that has to happen because it is rail too. So North Carolina Railroad owns the track and then Norfolk Southern is the operator of that track. So all parties have to be consulted in the development of this product. They build a good school, so I'm sure it'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lashley. I have no questions. Thanks for your presentation. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple quick questions. Uh, you, you talked about it being the 2.6 million being a grant. It, it's an appropriation from the General Assembly, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So the state's a partner. Melbourne would be a partner. We would be a partner. Can you just get really simple? Why is it beneficial for um, you know manufacturer and Melbourne to have access to a transit facility? Yeah, absolutely. So um, if I had a big county map, I'd show you that you know the rail which our county is pretty well known for splits right through the middle of the county and it follows very closely that interstate <coughs> well we have a lot of manufacturers that sit outside of that interstate corridor um, and we have a lot of people that could utilize this asset that don't sit right on rail it's very hard to get rail directly to your facility so this would open up opportunities for manufacturers farmers everybody to utilize this product um, and have it available to them so that they could then have rail without paying NCRR, Norfolk Southern for a rail spur. So you, you make a, a widget at your factory, uh, you manufacture it you know, in Mebane and then you truck it to the transload and then the rail takes it to Las Vegas. That's right. And then you don't have to have 17 trucks take your product to Las Vegas. Yeah. So the cost efficiency is there? Cost efficiency is there, uh, decongestion issues on the interstate is there. Um, I was talking to a food manufacturer the other day. They process about 80 trucks a day that they're sending from their small outfit operation. Do you anticipate that this would be a, a draw for, for entities that are not in Alamance County to come because it's here? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So there are two comparable products like this. One is in Winston-Salem. The other is in Fuquay Verena. So you could envision this asset really pulling a crowd from Orange County, Chatham County, Randolph County, and even from uh, Wake Counties and Forsyth Counties. Right. Because those two products are handling the bulk of demand for their surrounding counties as well as their own. Thank you. Yeah. All the folks, when we were out there, all those folks on that road, they all know about this. Yeah. Even the guy with all the flags on the other side of the trees. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This, this project has been, um, you know, we've been very engaging with mm -hmm. the public through this process. Um, we brought all the boards out there to see kind of the, the site. We advertised that mm -hmm. opportunity as well. Um, and this project, since it's been going on since 2015, has uh, incurred a lot of attention from neighbors. This is a big deal. Yeah. I think it's awesome. Also, what's the DOT um, improvement? that comes as a result of approving this? So DOT has considered a nearby location being paved to further take decongestion off of uh, Lake Latham Road and Holt Road that sits right there. Right. Um, and this is kind of a domino effect where the competitiveness of that opportunity, that project is scored much, much higher with a transload facility because then you're having more products and trucks coming through there and its competitiveness just skyrockets. Mm -hmm. If I had an operation selling whatever, tractors, lawnmowers, Box. so forth, <laughs> uh, that sort, currently it would have to be transferred by rail typically to Fuquay Farina or Winston-Salem. That's correct. If we build this facility, it'd be sent to Mevin, and the trucking would not be from Fuquay Verena down our interstate and our private roads. It would be right from Mevin to the facility. <coughs> That's correct. Therefore, yeah. many, many less tractor and trailers, uh, less wear and tear on our roads, um, 
and just more efficiency for our local businesses, both receiving and shipping. Is that correct? That's very correct. All right. Mr. Carter. Yeah, I, I'm not sure we'll see a lot of less as rapidly as we're growing. I'm just think, hoping maybe it'll hold it down a little bit so as, as we grow, instead of getting more and more traffic, this will help level that out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, we cut it out from Fuquay Verena to here, will it not? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and from Western yeah. Salem to here. Mm -hmm. All right. Motion to approve. Mr. Chairman, I got one. I got one more question, Mr. Chairman. Does the facility have any refrigeration capabilities? Uh, so there is a proposed. Let's see. Um, on that parcel, there's like a little line above the first um, kind of spur there. That's uh, it's hard to describe. Yeah, see the yeah. little line that's above there. Greg, would you point that out, please? Is it this one? Yeah, like. There's a little line above there. So there's going to be a uh, like an operating hut right there. And hut. yeah, like a hut. So there's not going to be cold storage right now that's planned. But I say that because this can grow. And if the demand for cold storage is there, um, then we can use this. In fact, I have uh, one of the industries that I showed you before uh, has committed about 90 cars per year that they would use at this facility uh, that would have to be cold storage base. So. Any other questions? Do we have a motion? I have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? I'll second. <laughs> Was that a second? All right. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to Vanna over there in the corner, too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. County Manager. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, just a note on that previous item that David just shared with us. I will put that in your budget for next year under our economic development budget will be the 300843 so that's where we'll fund that project okay, investment and in infrastructure from there. Um, I am back with you again tonight bringing your CIP uh, for the second time. So we introduced this to you at your April 3rd meeting. And tonight we are here to answer questions that you have, um, make any revisions or adjustments that you would like to make and then ask for you to adopt the fiscal year 23-24 funding for your five-year CIP. So although we're looking at projects that can span the next five years, we only allocate the funding on an annual basis, and we bring this plan back every year uh, for adjustments to reprioritize needs and projects, those sort of things. So sort of a dynamic document um, that will be changing uh, over the years, but um, it contains the needs for the county, for ABSS, and for ACC. And we are prepared to answer questions that you have so that we can hopefully move forward with adoption. This would be a commitment of spending that would help um, as we're building your recommended budget this would give us a large chunk set aside. Uh, and we are hoping to move from um, overdue deferred maintenance needs to becoming a little more proactive uh, to meet the growing needs of our facilities. That's one of the things I saw in here that I liked was that the, some of the way we're asking the school system to do it, let's the county take care of it too. But the, the only item in here that I really have a concern about right now, I think, is <laughs> this courthouse cost. Um, sure. And I've heard my fellow commissioners making comments about it. I, I feel like we need to get our budget under our belt mm -hmm. and Take a really hard look at what we need. 
I know we're going to, if, if we get approved a capital defenders or a uh, public defender's office and a an, an additional judge, we're going to need to provide space. We're already at cramped for space as it is. Uh, <coughs> so it's not a matter of do we need to do something, it's a matter of how much are we going to spend. And uh, I just, I, I feel like I'm, I'm choking on $67 million. So. Sure. And I think uh, the rest of my friends here on the dais are doing the same thing. I don't know. But. Let me just clarify for you on the courthouse project. You find that on page 35 of the document. And the status of that project is listed as unfunded. So we are not committing to a courthouse project, but felt like we needed to make sure that's on your radar screen right. as we anticipate <coughs> excuse me, uh, future needs that we would want to have, you know, be aware of that. <coughs> but this in no way commits you to funding a courthouse project at this time, nor any particular amount. It's uh, simply a placeholder. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we just don't know where that's going. So I think I've heard from all of you that there's consensus to kind of put the courthouse project on hold, get through the budget process, see where the numbers shake out, and then revisit that project probably sometime this summer. So that's what we're planning for that one at this point in time. Can I, can I go? Because I know Bill's got, he's, he's yeah. got money stuff too. <laughs> I am not going to your thunder because I know, what, I know where you're going. I just have some random questions, and I know that you will know what this means because I've looked through this whole thing and I want to know what in the world is that for? And so that's what I'm going to ask because every number is at least 2.5 inches long. Okay. Are we taking over the Family Justice Center's budget? What does that mean? That means, you know, like if they don't get the big grant. I, I was looking at their stuff. They've got some massive grants. I want to know what Family Abuse Services is doing because they have I mean, they handle shelter, the Justice Center does, because there is no shelter, so to speak. I, I mean, is Family Abuse Services mainly doing restraining orders? Is that what their role? Because they, I work for them. They were everything. And then the Justice Center comes along, and there's a conglomerate of everything in there. It's like the mall for this, and it was, it's perfect. Um, and I'm just, I'm just wondering about that. And let me just go ahead and ask some other questions because this is good reading. Okay, um, I know Crossroads was 225,000. I remember that one. We did that for art money. Are you talking about the operating budgets? Mm -hmm. No, just we gave them $225,000 art money the okay. first year I was on the commissioners last year. Got that because they were, they had lost their grants. They lost a lot of their funding through the government's crime commission and stuff. Um, this emergency equipment project, $800,000, what is that? So that was a state allocation that we received through the General uh, Assembly budget this past year. Okay. And what we were able to do is allow fire districts to get revenue for that. If you remember, that was brought before the board mm -hmm. and we were able to give them general fund dollars for that because we were able to use those funds for expenses that the county had. That was a blessing of the state okay. and that allowed them to get equipment that they needed. Great. The Diversion Center Project, <coughs> half a million, what is that 500000 So that again is through the state appropriation. It okay. was called through the SKIP grants um, and that was to go toward the Diversion Center. Those funds have not been spent as of yet. Okay. The Sheriff Safety Project, 84270 Again, that was SCIF funding. Okay. And that was to cover um, equipment that they had. All right. The Opioid Settlement Fund, 8874733. Mm -hmm. What if, Do we have that left? We have not made any expenses okay. out of those funds. That's great. Good. Thank you. Uh, Board of Elections, what is $1 million going to do for that building? Because I know we paid... 675 seven something for it and we're remodeling it we're not building it all over again so what is one million that's a beautiful building what are we doing for a million dollars i know you said it's going to be closing in the drive-through right i will have to defer that to sherry or brian to answer those complete plans for that building i know there are renovations that are taking place there is it being gutted the whole thing on the inside 
So, the, so half of that building is being gutted, and then there's going to be the, um, I guess you'd call it an, an addition mm -hmm. where we're closing in that drive-in. Right. That piece of closing that in was kind of expensive, but there's the second floor will probably kind of remain untouched. There's a little bit of construction up there, not much, but the first floor, there's a lot of construction. Because the whole point was for to get everything out of rental spaces that's the to store it in one thing. Yeah, that's okay. the plan. Okay. Um, the elderly services building, that's where fam uh, the Friendship <coughs> Day Center was for years. That's Is right. this I thought I read where it may be possibly the planning board's place and inspections one day. So $3 million to remodel that place. It's more than remodeling. So there's mold abatement issues. It's not ADA accessible. Mm -hmm. There's a roof, a roof that is leaking. Um, so we are asking for us to make an investment in that building if we want to keep it in the use could be determined down the road. Okay. We don't have that currently funded in your plan. Uh, that was just I too big a of a ticket okay. for us to include for the and the, fiscal year. On the page 40, um, safety assessment for ABSS, $1,218,000. Is, what is that for? Is that cameras? Is that security? Is that vestibules? What all is that? It's on page 40. We have a different page number, I think, than the online version versus the I'm sorry. hard copy. It's okay. I can pull it up. I'm, I'm looking at somebody that could probably tell me. Let me pull up the digital copy. I think that's the page 40. You say page 40. I've got EMS on page 40. But I think it's, it's under ABSS. Okay. Yeah, I still have EMS on that one. Is what that one I did see that in there. Let's see. So page 10 and then pages 12 and 13 contain ABSS projects. I don't have that book. What's the, what's the topic? No, okay. uh, it says Thompson, what's the topic? Safety, safety and security. Safety and secure. Yeah. Security. Mm -hmm. Me and two. And you're just wanting a clarification. I'm just what wondering what contains. is for. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Do you know Chris? It's in the five-year paygo. It's on page 10 of the uh, hard copy. My hard copy. Oh, five-year nice. paygo plan, 22-23, safety and security. 1.2 million in the first year, then 1.4, and then going down after that. Okay. Okay. Um, the prison annex, are we still using the prison annex? Yes, we are. We are. We have actual guys and guys and not girls, because I've done several interviews over there. It's not real pleasant. Sure. Okay. So we're going to put a, a roof on there for $125,000. That's great. Okay. And then we're going to, the old jail chiller is like 232204 That's not, that's the one on this side. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. And somewhere in all that, I noticed that three ball fields were going to be done. Yes. And uh, AOM, Holt, and Beaver Jordan, one million dollars a piece. Are the Yankees going to be there? I mean, what is what is that, Brian? You can tell me. I know we're talking lights, bleachers, bathrooms. Beaver Jordan, they not be awful. Yeah, unfortunately, they Beaver Jordan in particular, which would be the first stop, is um, needs a new everything. Yeah, uh, never had any investment there. I played um, ball now. That's how old it is. Well, I hadn't changed. Um, yeah. Nostalgic at this point. Um, Vintage. But the shelter needs to be replaced, the storage, the bathrooms, the concession stands, the field lights, uh, most of the fencing needs to be replaced, uh, the bleachers are concrete yeah. and breaking. So our priorities for these funds are the lights and, and the buildings with the restroom concession in there. Uh, I think those are going to be our top two priorities, but we should be able to do more with these funds and give it a complete overhaul. So this is, is this an art money, right? This it is, is not. Okay. Art money couldn't have done this. Well, we've designated the art funds for other projects. Okay. All right. But um, this was one of the priorities that continued to rise up during your board retreat. I know. I was, and was so I know. we're sort of out of place where we need to make a decision. Do we want to make an investment in these athletic 
fields. I we hope so, because rural community plays property taxes also. Yes. Um, open door clinic. Is this this sit in the Petri building? Is it that just got built? It is not. No. No. Okay. And Thank that's goodness. in next year. That's the fiscal year twenty four twenty five. Okay. Can start. Now, don't. I'm not gonna hurt your feelings, but I gotta ask this question. Cedar Rock Historical Post Office, three hundred thousand dollars. What are you doing to that building? Um, how are they going to get mail there? We're, we're going to help it stand up, I think it's the long-term goal. So that is um, one-story building, most of the way back to the park on your left before you mm -hmm. get to the park office. Um, that was the post office in 1896. We haven't received mail there recently. Um, but it is pretty literally falling down. So it's on the National Historic Register. We feel like we, we need to make a commitment to okay. maintaining it. Okay, uh, this is shocking all. I'm so sorry. Um, the old and new jail chiller replacement, 232 and 220. Um, that's the heating and air, right? Okay, in the old jail. All right, um, the sheriff's storage building and the landfill and the old maintenance building, a roof, 84,000. Where, that's at the landfill, because it says coating only. But that's like a 2025. 20, I'm just curious. I'm just see these numbers. I'm just asking right. where so we're headed. So they're bundling bundling those two projects together to meet mm -hmm. the fifty thousand dollar threshold to be okay. included in the CIP. Okay. In the old jail, is this the annex? They're talking about the replacement ceiling for six hundred twenty-five or sixty-two thousand five hundred. Is that the new jail? Is that the jail across the street? Is that the jail annex? It's the jail. Okay, okay, because when it leaks a lot, when they stop up the toilets. Okay, gotcha. Um, this blue modular, uh, I guess that's, is that a DSS? That's right. That's like a double wide on a school Correct. ground. I love those things, yeah, yeah. Mm. $84,000, okay. So it's two projects. It's the chiller house and the blue modular okay. roof replacements on both. Okay. Um, I, can somebody help me understand what we're going to do to this building for four million eight hundred and sixty dollars? Uh, that says um, civil court and county office renovation. Right. So that's not a project that is ripe or <laughs> ready for fruition at this yeah. point. Um, there has been some conversation in years past about needing to update this building once we move civil courts out. How could we better utilize that space uh, downstairs with the courtroom? So it, it's some of those type issues. Okay. I don't know that I've seen a plan since I've been here for that. Um, but again, that's an unfunded project that okay. is contingent upon the courthouse project. Okay. I just have to ask because I, I, we have groups that come here all the time. It's just constant. I need funding, I need funding, and then I see even bigger numbers from same groups on these things, and um, and I got a ballpark. Thank you. I appreciate that. People in Saks Paul will really appreciate being able to take their families to that ball field and watch your youngins run on that field. There's nothing better than families gathered together, and uh, I think that's really important. That's right up there with everything else. So thank you all for me putting you on the spot. Thank you. I know it's always up here, <coughs> knows all the numbers, so. Not really. Yes, really. <laughs> Anything else? No, I think I got it. All right, Mr. Lashley. Oh, sure. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just to clarify, everything that Ms. Thompson just reeled off to you is what you're encompassing for the whole entire five-year period. Yes. So I was thinking there's no way we could get all that done. That is beyond the capacity for next year. Right. Okay. And you're yes. looking for $2.3 million for the budget upcoming, correct? That is correct. Okay. For the county portion. Yep. Just want to uh, focus in on that particular number because I just want to ask you, and maybe um, Ms. Evans can help out as, as well here. Um, going back to the eight cent moniker when the bond projects were getting started, is there, I mean, it's, there's no way we can use that 0.96 of a penny on any of these things? Yes, we would use that. That's okay. part that, of that. Okay, uh, I, I'm getting 1.96. I'm just basing it on 1.6. It gives me 1.53 million. 
Okay. Is the 2.3 in, in an addition to this? It's not. The 2.3 is the total that we would need. So I could subtract 1.5 from that, and that's how much my budget's going to increase by like make roughly 800,000, 36,000. Um, the penny is not quite 1.5, is it? No, the, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he, I'm he's on. calculating out the, the thing. Let me look at one thing. Yeah, I'm just taking 0.96 and multiply it by 1.6 okay. million gotcha. and get 1.536 million. And I was just curious if if the 2.3 that you're asking, yes. am I subtracting the 1.53 from it and my addition is going to be roughly $836,000? Mm -hmm. So, um, so Yes. Yes. Um, there is a portion of debt service um, in the amount of 200000 that would come out of that figure um, because we would definitely have to make that uh, debt service requirement, but the remaining would be applied for these funds. Okay, so we're looking at roughly a million dollars mm -hmm. increase. Okay, I'm just just making a list of all the things that we've uh, already paid, yes. yet we haven't, got, we haven't gotten any tax money. I'm just keeping a list of that. I want to make sure we don't go too far too fast in that direction. Um, getting to uh, what Ms. Thompson brought up about the ball fields, I just wanted to ask mm -hmm. Brian. Um, I see there's $1 million for the, every year for the next three years going forward. Would you break that million dollars up and just, just for example here, would you use one-third for AO, one-third for um, uh, EM Holt, one-third for B. Everett Jordan, or would you do the one that is, has, has the most need? first so our plan is to do a field at a time just completely refurbish one field okay. if, if we get there and there's significant cost savings to buying all the lights at once for example okay. we'll talk to the vendors about that I don't anticipate that I anticipate us being able to refurbish one field at a time um, move some of the games that might be on another field while we're refurbishing it and, and be able to handle our the, the capacity for the games Oh, well, this is a this is a big spend for the yes. Parks and Recs just because I'm a, I'm just I don't have numbers in front of me, but I'm thinking the Parks and Recs budget is right about 1.85 million a year. It's close. Yep. So this would be a really big injection to to the Parks and Recs, and and I do believe I I've actually been to all three of these fields. Uh, my niece and nephew play on these fields. I have a lot of people in that particular community who's reached out to me to say, hey, look. What are you going to do about that field today? Oh, mm -hmm. so I'm glad we're we're focusing on it. I just want to sort of like maybe d d is is can we do it for less than three million bucks so over three years? Um, just to let you know that I had put some money in my <laughs> budget for for this, but I didn't get anywhere close to a million dollars. I, I got three hundred and fifty. So I think it was something we could talk about because I think it definitely needs to be done. Uh, I know the folks that live out in that community are are, are looking for, and I, I think it would be used more if it was in better shape, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. We have some rough cost estimates we can share. Yeah, we do. Uh, and, and I've got a rough breakdown of, of where those funds would be. So restroom and a concession uh, building that are combined, We, if we're looking at something prefab, which is probably the cheapest way to do that, that's going to be close to $400,000 just by itself. Um, the field lights are about 225 um, <clears throat> per field. Um, the shelter is somewhere between 90 and $100,000. Um, and then also looking at the demolition of existing buildings, fixing the fences, fixing the press boxes, and some contingency in there. So can we do it cheaper? Maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want to make this big push and then run out of money to not get this done. And we should. But they need a significant amount of investment and it's going to be pretty close to that um, to refurbish it. Thank you. Um, I did have another question, but that's why I need to write things down because I didn't know I can't remember. Things. <laughs> oh yes, thank you. Uh, the, 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 the safety issues that we're uh, dealing with the ABSS. Uh, this is one of the high priority things as far as I'm concerned uh, and I and I really hope and I'm looking forward to the, the school system knocking out the things that we were talking about last time for the, the, yep. the safety for the schools that's really important uh, and and I at some point when when this these things get taken care of 
I can speak for myself. <laughs> I can't speak for anybody else on this board, but I certainly would like to go and uh, and, and tour after after Great. it's been done. Because I have a lot of folks in the community who are uh, really applauding the fact that Alamance County is one of the only places in the state that has SROs mm -hmm. in all the schools. Yeah. I'd like to um, I'd like to keep that up, yeah. making sure that we're the safest school system in the state. Actually, the country would be good for me. Yes. But that's all. We were number one, as announced on Fox News, yeah. Yeah. the only school system <coughs> in the entire country with an SRO in every school. And I, I certainly like to build on that. Yeah. Well, maybe we can get back on that bus that we went on, <laughs> we all went on when we went to see the before, and now we can see the after. Okay, mm -hmm. um, Mr. Thomas. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. He, he does Swear it too. We are, we're cousins. Right, just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> uh, a couple lines of questioning. The first is the um, staying with the fields. I mean, I'm looking at over five years. The the total amount for the ask is uh, for identified projects is 7.4 million. The fields are three million of that. That's about 40 percent. Yeah. Um, what, what do we currently use? What does the county use AO, EM Holt, and the Everett Jordan for? So we use this for football and baseball. <laughs> we have basketball games there as well, but those are in the gyms, so outside of the scope of, of this request. This is for the fields that are baseball. County youth, uh, youth athletics? Yeah, exclusively, yeah. Okay. Um, why these particular fields? So they're, they're our most popular fields because they're well positioned. So we, we've, we, in the county geographically. So we have other fields that we've used over time at churches, at various community centers. Uh, I think we've realized that to maintain all of the fields we've historically used is a bridge too far. So we are consolidating into four locations, one in each corner of the county um, to try and try and give us adequate coverage of the whole county so that's why we've chosen these they're spread out across the county uh, we're taking off some schools that we traditionally used like Sylvan Elementary we're moving out of that facility just to keep the costs as low as we can is the thinking that if we improve these facilities then more kids would use our athletic uh, program that's certainly a hope. I mean, at this point, it's it's a little beyond the, the quality of those fields is a little beyond trying to attract kids. They're they're unsafe on some level. Some of the schools, um, so we we are not holding games or practices at all at B. Ever Jordan right now because it's just not adequate to have kids there. Um, so we got to get that base threshold first. So let's make it safe. But I do think if we invest heavily in these facilities, we'll see more kids come out and participate. We should be able to host a wider variety of things there and uh, do some other sports that we can't do right now. A lot of kids in the cities go to the municipalities uh, programs. Is there any interaction between those programs? Absolutely. We've got a great relationship with the cities. So if the cities, each individual city has its own enough kids to make a league in a particular sport, they'll do that and we won't uh, cross with them. We'll just play with county kids. But if uh, older U13 girls softball, for example, rarely has enough for one municipality or for the county to make a league by itself. So we combine those leagues so okay. make sure they have. A so if you live down there, be able Jordan, you could practice down there, and then if you're in, if you're joined with the city, then maybe play in a city, yeah, you facility can, or something like that. You'll be able to play, and, and you'll have an away game, and you'll have to drive to that. But the alternative is if we don't invest in these facilities, then we're asking kids who live in the northern and southern part of the county to drive into Burlington right. two, three nights a week to play, and a if, lot of them can't do it. If we improve these facilities, I mean, all of these facilities are located at schools. Right. Is there any connection with the school system in terms of after school leagues or keeping kids at school involved in athletic events uh, where, other, where we're not now, and would improving these fields help with that? Yeah, absolutely. So. A kind of a separate initiative that we're trying to do is to integrate youth athletics into the after-school programs at schools. Uh, it's very important just because the traditional model that we have of practicing on weeknights, playing on, on weekends is great if you have transportation, if you have coverage, uh, enough grown-ups in that child's life to make all the driving, to make it all work out uh, on a Tuesday night in addition to feeding your kids and doing homework and everything. 
that's just not reality for a lot of parents and those kids are missing out on opportunities to be healthy and to get all the benefits that youth sports provides mm -hmm. so we're trying to integrate uh, youth athletics into the after school to include those kids these facilities would be dual use that's the advantage of them being at the schools they could be used during the after school period by that set of kids used in the evening by kids in the traditional model okay um, the other kind of line of questioning is related to when you get to years four and five there, there are just not many asks that's so it's front loaded first three years 2.3 and then falls over or falls down you know basically uh, 450,000 290 if, if we really need if they really have that many needs why aren't we populating that that request so this is a five-year plan funded on an annual basis there's capacity as we go on over time because needs will arise as we go further down the line so this just allows us to make this a plan that changes with the priorities and the needs we anticipate that there'll be new projects there'll be new needs there'll be different priorities and those years will fill in as we go do you have a sense generally of the 2.3 number and how that compares with other counties in terms of the, them maintaining sure. their buildings yeah so we talked earlier that 2.3 was less than the commitment that some of our neighbors make on their capital plans like person county um, they're, they're actually spending a little more on capital annually so it's really just a question of priorities for this board in terms of how you want to support your infrastructure and needs going forward I mean I think we saw recently we had a $90,000 emergency need at our environmental health services because we fell through the floor there um, because that building hadn't been maintained much like the elderly mm -hmm. services building so this is just trying to get us to a place where we're able to proactively take some of that deferred maintenance plan for it over time hopefully save money over time so we don't have to come ask for ninety thousand dollars in one fell swoop Mr. Oh. I think it's a great idea doing the first of all just coming up with the project just like we've asked our school system to do just that a few minutes ago if they need to do it we certainly need to do it and uh, determine what those needs are not you know the sad part is <coughs> probably not a comprehensive list of the things that we need to do right. it's a good first pass I think and, right. uh, I'm thinking we can find more we'll we'll fine-tune this over time <laughs> It's oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what that meant. But <laughs> We're on the bar. <laughs> 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 you, you got a chicken in your hip pocket out there, Henry? <laughs> um, or did you lay one right there? Which one is My it? <laughs> <laughs> the egg man himself. Okay. Uh, I'm done. All right. All three of these projects with the school funding and so on goes to the school facility for improving their fields, correct? You're talking about the athletic facilities? The three, right. Right, so those are, those are owned by the school. Correct. We will, would maintain them and make the investment in them. And currently we have a really, really good working relationship with ABSS and they're allowing us to use their fields, correct? That is correct. But we need to make the public know that we're spending this money on school facilities at the same time. So, uh, Dr. Butler, we want you to assure us that you're going to continue to help us out. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Butler. <laughs> Any other discussion? Just to add on, when Craig was asking questions, um, Dr. Thorpe and I, in 2020, could come down to you at Cedar Rock to talk about this after school programs to offer kids things that they probably wouldn't be able to get involved in anyway so that they're there and it's part of their after school and uh, it was just very important because a lot of the children don't get the opportunity to do what some of us always just do it's just not part of their normal thing and getting kids moving exercising around great role models is the most important thing and like what you just said John about the school property you know children are all of ours they're all of ours. I don't care if they're Alamance County government or Arlington City government or ABSS or whatever. They are all of our children and we're supposed to make sure they're safe. That's why we have seen some really horrendous things on the news lately. 
when it comes to that and all this safety with all the schools you know you just you don't want to think about that but you just do my daughter's a teacher and she was telling me on the way back from Raleigh Saturday night she said she teaches elementary school third grade for five years and now she's AIG and she said um, I never thought that I would have second and third graders to say no no miss herring if a shooter comes in the building what are we supposed to do now miss herring you know because I talked about this in church and I'm like, you know she never thought she'd hear stuff like that never ever because kids don't even need to be thinking that kind of stuff but that is the really sinful world that we live in and um, it is a presence of evil like I've never seen and I'm old and so um, but I just want us to always look at our kids are all of ours and um, we need to be there for each other and be there for the children and whatever we can do to add to their life so that they'll be great leaders one day I think we need to do it so thank you now as I understand we're voting on the five-year plan but we're only locked in for the first year right we're asking for you to adopt the plan with the allocation of your fiscal year 23 24 funding only we'll be bringing this back at the same time next year for a review of new projects new allocation and the funding for that upcoming fiscal year at that time so just one year at a time for the funding approval and adoption of the plan as the concept and I might indicate just to the general public um, the county manager and I and the school board uh, chair and the superintendent met one day last week and they are as I understand it developing their own five-year plan uh, which they will present to us in the near future is that correct we will present it to the board next week and then to you after that thank you Bye, board. so they're doing the same thing that we're doing uh, on a five-year plan uh, just want the general public to be aware of that. Any other discussion? Any other questions? Do we have a motion? I'll motion make, to approve. Oops, sorry, that's Pam. okay. I'll second yours. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, the Board Chair, you can decide who made the motion and who did. I was second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. See, we guys out in TV land, we really do work. We go through all this stuff. <laughs> okay. County Attorney Report. Nothing else for me tonight. Thank you, Court. I like that report. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. You do a really good job. I no, I mean that. I really appreciate because I come to you and you see me on the sidewalk. It's like, no! And I'll, it's always about something and you haven't run away from me yet. I really appreciate it. And I will. Thank you. Well, you do a great job. We're very blessed to have you. Thank you. Okay. County Manager 8A. Yes. I have two reports in your packet nothing out of the ordinary these are satisfying the requirements of the fiscal policies to include your investment report and then the quarterly management report anything further? I did have one further thing if you'll indulge me I'd like to introduce you to our new parks and recreation director miss Jamie Merkel is with us here in the audience <laughs> <laughs> Jamie has been with us a week and a day, I think. So we are enjoying adding her to the team. We think she's going to be a great addition here to Alamance County government. Do you go by Brian? Is that? She's not listening. Does she go by? Oh, I was asking her, do you go by Brian? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I answered to Brian too. Okay. She doesn't want to be associated with me. Okay. <laughs> Welcome aboard. We look forward to wonderful things. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Nothing else. Thank you. All right. Um, Pam, you want to start? I'm done. Mr. Lashley. Hold on a second. I'm looking for my notes. I got some questions. <laughs> about, I got some questions about uh, the interest earned. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Look how y'all get all perky talking about it. I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. I don't even understand the if, if it was pro if it was English, I'd probably sh <laughs> sh 
shut away, stay away from it. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to ask that the thing that this what you get, sent me is all based on from July 1st of 2022 to the end of 2022. So that six month period, 7-22 to 12-22. That's correct. Okay. This report is from July 1 through December 31st, 2022. So okay. for six months of the year. Well, I think, first of all, I want to say, I think you did a good job with what you had in front of you because I went back and looked at how some of the things that you did uh, early in the year in 2022. Mm -hmm. Wow getting less than 1%, yeah, and, and now they're, they're handing you five. Yes. <laughs> so I think that's good, I, and, the, and to keep that up, but I just wanted to just ask you again, because I couldn't quite remember, and I just wanted, it seems like from your, um, from your list, it looks like you're putting in about $2 million per organization, is that mm -hmm. roughly about right? That's roughly about right. Um, so what I do is look at what we have that is maturing, as well as any excess cash that we have on hand. Um, sometimes I'm splitting investments between purchasing a commercial paper and then moving those funds to the North Carolina Capital Management Trust. By moving the funds to the Capital Management Trust, it keeps it liquid so that if we were to have an emergency arise, then we can pull those funds down, uh, but trying to maximize our interest earnings as much as we can throughout this year. That's what I was gonna ask you. If you, uh, some of these companies, do you have like, um a penalty do you have to pay if you that's even awesome yeah. that's that's that's, your, that's what i wanted to hear um let me just see if i can find my notes real quick and if not i'll ask you later um oh i saw something on first horizon bank uh and i see that you uh them and truest bank is the ones i wanted to, do you have majority of your cds in those two, two those two organizations yes um can you tell me something about Truist Bank? I mean, why you use them? Um, historically, that's where that one had been purchased. Okay. Um, it's one of those investments that I inherited. Gotcha. Um, we don't keep a lot in CD. That's right. And a lot of times with CDs, there were special purposes when they were invested. Okay. Um, so historically, we have just left those in the branch of what they're, where they were first invested. Do you know if it comes due soon? It's not a lot of money compared it's to what It's not a what, lot of money. Um, the First Horizon one, actually, um, we cashed that one in because the, when we went to reinvest that one, um, they did not have a mechanism that was approved by the LGC for us to reinvest in. So I did have to end up cashing that one out, and I'm seeking other investment options right now for that one. Um, for Truist, I believe that one will renew again in... I want to say November. This coming November. But I will double check that. Yeah, no I don't worries. have that number right in front of me. No, no worries. Thank you. Did you notice that you get taller? Will you shop those when they become? <laughs> you just yes. Oh, I'm not kidding. Real anything? I don't. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, you did. Well, I, I did want to address a couple of things that were raised during the public comments period. One right. was. Uh, comment about doubling taxes. Uh, increasing the property value rate does not necessarily imply, and in this situation, will not. I, we, I'm 100% confident, will not imply doubling your taxes. The tax rate is what determines what you pay in taxes, not the value. And we're looking and we're committed to try and approximate a revenue-neutral tax rate, which should keep your taxes at about the same. Now the question then becomes, how much is your property value increased relative to the rest of the mix? And you should take a look at that. And if you haven't already filed an appeal, you should have filed an appeal if it's in excess of about, the number I'm hearing now is closer, it's gone up above 75, maybe to about 76. Is that well, right? Mine went from 65 to 135, but we want to say one talking thing. Talking about the average. Justification. Talking about the average. I do. The average is going to approximate, uh, approximate about a 76% increase across the county. Right. That's so the if, your average, if yours is above that average, then I would encourage you definitely to file an appeal. And, uh, well, but, mobile homes don't appreciate, first of all. <laughs> they don't. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's 2008. But I, the, the one thing but I do want to say. I'm sorry, this is not a question and answer period. Right. 
this is county commissioner comment periods. Right. I'm sorry. Right. I just, in general, to the, to the population, take the time to file an appeal if you think it's going it to definitely impact your tax rate or your personal taxes. Um, drag queen events, definitely opposed, and we've stood against them in the past, and I think as a group we stand against them today, and uh, I don't think we're going to see those events happen in our public libraries. So, um, At the one I spoke of was actually in school. Sorry. <laughs> um, ambulance bills and the, the charge of ambulance bills predates our discussions with the court today. Ambulance bills, we've been dealing with that ever since I've been on the board. Yes. Been in a number of meetings years before I was on the board. We've dealt with it for years. Um, it, it just It's one of those things that uh, it is what it is. You have to charge off a certain amount and you just can't collect them if people aren't going to pay and don't have any capacity. I mean, we, if you can't, if there's nothing to go after, you can't go after it. So. You can't never not let somebody that's right. in the hospital. That's right. And that's the other, that's the other issue there. Yeah. I mean, we can't drive <laughs> to somebody and say, can you pay to go to the hospital? If they can't, we can't turn them down. That's right. We've got, we've got to take care of our citizens. We've got some citizens who can't afford to pay. So, anything else? That's it. If the drag queen thing, and I've, I'm not sure I totally understood, and I'm not asking for a comment, but if it's in the schools, you need to address the gentleman that's right across the aisle from you, uh, and or the board chair who's sitting on the back row. Uh, but I don't think that's in the schools. I, I'd be shocked if it was. And nobody on this board, as far as I know, would support such an activity. As far as the taxes are concerned, one, we county commissioners did set the when it's going to be appraised. We did do that. And we did it not because I've heard on the radio and all kinds of places and accusations that we picked the highest rate possible and determined that because it was going to be the highest rate in the entire history of the world. Uh, I'm exaggerating there slightly, but not much. Uh, obviously, that was not the case. We uh, picked that date and shortened it from the eight years because we were paying substantial penalties in your tax dollars back to the state of North Carolina going to the utilities. That's why we did it at that point. We had no way of knowing that that was going to be the highest or the lowest or anything else. Uh, unfortunately, the inflation rate is continuing, and it's just staggering what's happened, happening to inflation. So I anticipate possibly housing costs continuing to rise. I hope that's not the case. But unfortunately, it looks like that's going to be the case. Um, we did not do anything about the assessed re tax rate or the assessed rates. We county commissioners, none of us are on the board of adjustment. Uh, we simply picked the date for the appraised value. Uh, now we do, and we five do control the tax rate, and that's what Mr. Carter was referring to as revenue neutral. So we hope that we bring the tax rate down from 65 cents per 100 to 42, 43, you know, somewhere in that nature. Uh, and we have not done that yet, and that will be done. We'll talk about it at our first meeting in June, and then we've got to lock into it at our second meeting in June, uh, because it has to be passed before June 30 of each and every year. So that tax rate you'll know relatively soon. Uh, I would encourage taxpayers to look at their appraised value, then multiply it or divide it by 100, multiply it by 0.42 or 0.43, and that may, and I did not say will or shall, uh, that may give you a pretty close estimate as to what your tax bill will likely be. And then compare it to last year's. Um, you know, we had not had an appraisal in many, many years, and we were way out of alignment with the entire state, which is why we were being penalized. I've heard additional uh, comments, particularly on the radio and uh, some other 
things in publication pointing out to me that I picked the highest rate it could ever be, highest appraised value. That's not true. Um, and that uh, yeah, this revenue neutral thing is a scam. That's not true either. We county commissioners want it to be fair to everyone. Uh, and as one of the other commissioners previously pointed out, if your uh, property, if you've made improvements to it, you know, our tax department picks up on permits and all kinds of things, and so that would be possibly an adjustment. Um, with mobile homes, I can't address that really because uh, I agree, typically those values would go down, but the land values would not go down. Um, and so that's you know, that's a, an unknown variable that uh, that I cannot address. Uh, there are all kinds of issues that are on this. We're trying to be fair to our tax citizens, and all of us are taxpayers. And I suspect most, if not all, of you guys are taxpayers. Uh, we want it to be fair. We've got to fund your needs and services, and that's why you pay taxes in the first place. That's all I have. Motion to adjourn. I'm sorry. Motion to adjourn. Second. Mr. Thompson. A motion to adjourn. A second. All in favor, signify by, by saying I and we. Um. <laughs>